Greetings, saints, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to the final installment in our series entitled Ministry Dynamics, where we've been looking at the various aspects of ministry, because as I said earlier on in other uh, installments, that we are all called to minister. We are all called to impart God's glory and demonstrate Christ in a practical way to one another and, of course, to the world. So that's why we've been looking at ministry dynamics, because we all need to understand. And there are many simple but practical mini principal ministries that we can draw from Scripture. And that's what we've been doing, learning from the Lord and, of course, His apostles. So today we're going to be looking at a passage in Mark chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 1 up to verse 20. And it's the story of Jesus and the Gadarene demoniac. And we began to talk about issues to do with deliverance um, in the last installment. But I just felt to double click a little bit today on the issue of dealing with the demonic. Because this is very important for us if we are to advance God's kingdom effectively. Mark 5 verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus was saying to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went in into the pigs. The herd, about two thousand in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. We praise the Lord for his wonderful, wonderful word, demonstrating the faithfulness, the love, and the power of Jesus Christ. How he is concerned about our practical day-to-day -day issues and that he wants us to be free from the enemy's power. So to begin with, we're just going to look at uh, what we get from the story. Now, this story is loaded with many principles in terms of dealing with the demonic and we're not going to be able to cover them all in just one sermon. But I'd just like to highlight some of the key points that can get us going in a sense. And the first thing I want to talk about briefly is the origins of oppression, or the origins of demonic oppression. This man was severely uh, oppressed. He had a legion of demons, which was anything from two to 7,000 evil spirits living within him. And so it's important for us to try and understand from the story what could have possibly got this man to this terrible state where he was living naked, unrestrained, unrestrainable in the tombs, areas associated with the dead. A nasty place, but we can get some hints from this passage as to how this all uh, began. But one of the interesting things, you find that demons love to dominate a specific geographical 
area. And uh, that's why even when Jesus was dealing with this person and dealing with these demons, these demons begged to not be cast out of the area. Demons like to dominate a particular area. That's why you find you go to a particular place, there are certain spirits that seem to dominate. We found that ministering in different places, there are certain spirits that seem to, to be more prominent or prevalent. Some places we found spirits to do with fornication and adultery uh, manifest more and are stronger in that area. Some places we found uh, spirits to do with violence, murder, uh, seem to dominate more. Some places we find spirits that are called in Shona Chikwambo. Uh, some would call them uh, succubus spirits, uh, sexually molesting spirits, are more common in other areas. In other places, witchcraft. I remember another place in, uh, called Merewa, there were spirits that dominated that deliberately fought um, children or high school uh, children, particularly as they were about to write exams, these spirits would oppress them and uh, make them sick and they would lose their minds uh, en masse. And uh, many would not be able to write their exams and many would fail if they did end up writing their exams. And I remember when we went there and we did the crusade, it was one of our last crusades of the year around November, just before or just as the rainy season was beginning. And these children, many of them were just beginning to write their exams. And uh, one of the headmasters came, he was a believer, and he said, praise God you've come at this particular point in time. Because every year we have this issue with um, the exam classes. They all manifest, they all develop what has been called mass hysteria. And we think it could be spiritual. And of course they came and uh, preached the word to them, taught them who Jesus was, told them to give their lives to Jesus first of all. And I'd barely begun to pray. I even I'd, hadn't even begun giving an altar call, and these demons suddenly, en masse, began to manifest. And of course, by God's grace, we cast those demons out, and we followed up, and we heard the next year that many of these uh, kids wrote their exams well, and they passed, which hadn't happened uh, for a while before. So certain demons seem to like dominating specific areas. And uh, so... Perhaps this was, could have been what happened with this man. And that's how you find his location. He was in the tombs. I don't know how that began. Perhaps he had lost a family member or family members or a loved one and had begun to stay and spend a lot of time uh, at the graveside with the tombs. And uh, that might have opened the door for him. Perhaps he had unresolved grief and he constantly spent time there. So sometimes you have to be careful where we spend our time. Um, not just grave sites, uh, but a place where fornication is taking place, drunkenness, and all these things, pl places associated with certain things can open uh, doors for us to be possessed. People have been known to commit murder, uh, acts of violence, and all these things as a mob uh, because a person happened to be at the wrong place, wrong time, they left home not wanting to do a certain thing, but because they were at the wrong place or the wrong crowd, they got influenced by demons. So sometimes it's to do with a particular area. Another thing that you find about demonic oppression is that it seems that it could be progressive. At times it's actually progressive. It develops over time and becomes stronger and stronger. And the spirits seek, seek to entrench themselves more and more over time as they are not cast out. That's why you find that the Bible, they actually say that this man had demons that possessed him and no one could bind or restrain him anymore. The scripture says no one could restrain him anymore, which means there probably was a time that these demons would afflict him, but people could still restrain him when they wanted to. But there was a time, there came a time eventually where they couldn't even restrain him anymore. So it, it was, there was a buildup to this. So the more you allow demons to inhabit your life and you open doors to them and you don't deal with it, you don't confess it before the Lord, you don't seek help, the stronger often they seem to become. And sometimes it actually becomes difficult to tell the difference between the person's personality and the actual personality of the demon. They become so intertwined as time uh, carries on with these demons not being cast out. So it's important to realize that when demon, the demonic problem is realized, it has to be dealt with promptly. It reminds me of a story I heard of a certain young lady in a place called Chihota who her oppression started by just watching pornography. She, was, she got bored. She was at her sister's uh, home, her sister and brother-in-law, 
and she got bored during the day, started watching movies. She didn't know that there was uh, pornographic movies, DVDs within the, the movies she was watching and suddenly stumbled upon these uh, pornographic DVDs, started watching them, and started uh, to get involved in masturbation. Then she started getting involved in fornication with her one steady boyfriend, and that was not enough. And then from there, she progressed to having uh, affairs with married men and uh, also, and, and she wouldn't select who she was getting involved with sexually, unprotected sex. And it all started by just watching one pornographic DVD. And by the time we got there, ministering to her, two years later, after she had started this, she was living wildly. She was a wild uh, teenager. And sometimes people wouldn't know where she is. And she would be shaking up with that man and then next with another man. And they couldn't find her. And she was living a wild life. A young girl. But it all started by watching pornography, then masturbation, then fornication, and then full-blown wild living. So there is often a progression to these things if they are left undealt with. Now I want to look at some of the effects of demonic oppression. The effects, and before we go on to the effects, one thing I find quite interesting there is that these demons work in numbers, but they often have a kingpin, if you like. When Jesus asked the demon, he said, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, because we are many. And he was dealing or talking to one demon, but uh, this demon was fronting for thousands of demons. So when someone is oppressed by an evil spirit, there is often a kingpin working in cahoots with other demons. And I found this uh, quite common, that when there is one particular type of spirits, invariably um, you will find that there is another or certain other type of spirits that you find there, like a cluster, a related cluster. For instance, if you're dealing with an orphan spirit, uh, it's quite likely that you'll find with an orphan spirit, there's a Sagaba spirit there. You'll find that there's a spirit of death there. you also find that um, there's a spirit of perversion there, and bitterness, and all these things, they, that they work together in cahoots. And if you don't deal with the root demon, which is the orphan spirit, the other spirits, the sexual perversion, spirits and anger, murder, will continue rising up and be difficult to deal with because the root or the kingpin, in this case it was legion, has not been dealt with. So it's important to be able to identify uh, the kingpin or the one who opened the door and deal with the doorman, and it's easier to deal with all the other spirits. And now looking at the effects uh, of demonic oppression. One of the things that you find there, from which you learn from the story, is that there's an obsession with the taboo, obsession with things taboo. This man was probably now obsessed with graves and obsessed with hills, things associated with, with death and wild animals. That was now his, visibly his obsession. That was what was happening there. And uh, demons want us to obsess with things unclean, things unusual, things unnatural. It reminds me of a certain uh, gentleman that we went to college with. And I'm not saying he was demon-possessed, but I think sometimes it can be due to demon possession, such behavior. Because if he was watching a movie and there was no blood and guts spilt in the first two, three minutes, he'd walk out of the movie and say, this movie is boring. He was... Uh, hungry he had a hunger and a thirst to see blood and violence and murder so sometimes there's this gory demonic curiosity that one can develop obsession with dead people obsession with witchcraft obsession with the occult and people feel drawn to these things consistently that it consumes one's mind and one's time and if that happens that could be a sign that uh, there is a demonic influence rising and taking over one's life the other thing that you see there in terms of an effect of demonic oppression is an unnatural and extreme self-isolation this man lived among the tombs no one lives among tombs he was probably alone in those tombs and in the hills hills are associated with wild animals even today it's very rare that people would willingly settle in on a, on a hillside normally residences, homes are built in the plain or in a valley, but not in the hills. Hills are associated with wild animals and all these things. But that's where he lived. Graves, a gravesite, and in the hills. And Satan, when he dominates someone, would want to isolate you. He wants you to feel that it's a natural thing not 
to interact with people, not to want to have friendship, not to want to have marriage, not to want to live in community with people. Now, of course, I'm not saying that if you definitely want to get married, then it's demonic. But some people have the gift of celibacy, like Paul. But there is a time when it's actually unnatural and it's inspired by demons. And that's why I believe right now there is outcry of what's happening uh, in one of the biggest churches, the Catholic Church, with it, that uh, many priests are said to have abused uh, the laity and abused young boys, young girls, and probably because they were living in an unnatural situation, isolated from um, that kind of marriage opportunity and relationship. So demons seek to isolate you from natural relationships. There is also an issue of systematic self-destruction. This man, the Bible says, was wounding himself. He was cutting himself. And I believe that's part of the reason why they tried to restrain him. He was hurting himself. And you find that when there is demonic oppression in a person's life, people do things that seem to sabotage their lives, sabotage their health, sabotage their relationships. Some people can't hold down a job. And they get a very good job. And for no reason, they uh, fight with the manager or they steal and they can't explain why they did that very nasty thing and they ruined that opportunity. Some people ruin their marriages or marriage prospects and they can't explain why they just sabotage themselves or sabotage that situation when things are about to develop to a meaningful, into a meaningful, uh, to a meaningful place. They just sabotage it or the devil himself sabotages it. We've had cases where people just as they were about to do the marriage ceremony, suddenly um, the groom-to-be disappears. On the day, he's supposed to come and do the lobola, which is the traditional way of marriage in Africa. And uh, I've heard cases of it happening three, four times to the same person. The groom just bolts for no reason. Well, we know it's for a demonic reason. So the enemy will seek to sabotage. A person may engage in behavior that harms them, like drug addiction alcohol addiction. They know it's destroying their liver, it's destroying their relationships, it's destroying their health overall, but they say, I can't help it. I need to keep doing this, even though it's destroying them gradually, leading them to an early grave. And then the other thing as well, one of the effects of uh, demonic oppression is you find that there is spiritual noise. The Bible says that this man would cry out so there was noise wherever he was, and I guess people would know where he is because he would be crying out, and the devil loves to make noise. He loves to make cause a rockers. And now, his noise may not be literal uh, decibels, but sometimes he can make noise spiritually. He wants to intimidate. He wants to uh, grab the limelight and the attention. Um, sometimes when a person is demon-possessed, uh, whenever they enter into a place, there is commotion that takes place, and people notice it uh, in a bad way, that this person has come. The moment they step into the room, um, there is conflict. The moment they step into the room, someone is hurt, someone is going to be told something that's going to pierce them and cut them. The moment they step into a place, things go missing. The moment they step into a place, there is disharmony, there is disunity. It's a form of noise, which means not always in terms of sound, but in terms of the effect of their behavior. It's like noise pollution, the way they affect people around them. And then the next thing I want to talk about is about Jesus as the ultimate deliverer. And of course, he steps into the situation and uh, immediately the demons recognize his authority and his power over them. They realize and they acknowledge that they're actually at the Lord's mercy because Jesus ultimately is the only one who can set someone free from demonic oppression. It doesn't matter what you're going through, you're suffering uh, constant nightmares, you dream of death, you dream of destruction, uh, you dream of all sorts of nasty things, uh, you're involved in behaviors that you can't shake off, it may be lust, it may be anger, uh, it may be suicidal thoughts, it may be even murderous intention, and you're struggling with this, it may be addictions, you're addicted to something, addicted to porn, addicted to alcohol, Jesus has the supreme power that is able to deliver any person the moment these demons came into the Lord's presence, they acknowledged. And they even sh cried out and said, please don't torment us uh, before our time. And they knew who he was. Demons know who Jesus is. The moment Jesus steps into a situation, 
they recognize him. Doesn't matter if you go to a place uh, in the Zambezi Valley or in the Amazon where people have never heard of, of Christ, never heard of church. But the moment you preach Jesus, I tell you, if there's demons in that place, they will acknowledge, they will manifest. Because the old demons know Jesus, even if the person that is carrying them doesn't know that, doesn't know Jesus, but demons. And they found this time and again. They know Jesus. And that also means that when we have Jesus Christ in us, and you have Jesus Christ in you as a believer, spirit-filled, you've got the power to even set parameters for demons, even the most stubborn of demons. Well, sometimes, you see, deliverance is a process. Sometimes it may take uh, one sitting. Sometimes it may take many sittings because you work through issues. You identify what brought those things in. You identify the wrong thinking that they brought in and that um, that person needs to be removed from they need to start thinking differently for them to be free in the long term so sometimes it's a process and in that process demons may want to interfere they may want to discourage the person from coming uh, for uh, deliverance or for counseling they may want to discourage or cause fear in that person so that that process is, is uh, aborted midway but we can actually set parameters for them there are times when i've sensed this and I'll tell the demons, because I know that I'm still building up to casting all of them out as I'm helping the person. And I tell them uh, that I'm, you are not allowed to hinder this person from coming uh, for counseling. And you tell them. Sometimes they may manifest violently as you're speaking. And you can tell them, in the name of Jesus, stop manifesting right now. I still need to talk to this person. Demons, be quiet. And they quieten up, and you can continue with your counseling session. Sometimes when they do manifest and you're, counsel, you're, you're casting them out, they may be try to hurt the person or make the person bang their head on the floor or against the wall. And you have to tell them to stop that and to get out, uh, what they tell them to get out quietly or to get out without injuring the person. And they obey because when Jesus is in the place, they have no option but to obey. And that's why Jesus told them what to do. He gave them permission to go into the herd of pigs. And that's what they did. And that's how they left. They couldn't just do what they desire. So even no matter how strong a spirit or how entrenched it's been in a person, you must never allow yourself to get intimidated. You still have the power and the authority to set parameters for them. Sometimes a person may bolt and they go very fast because demons can produce supernatural demonic strength in a person. Now this person had so much strength that that strength was able to drown 2,000 pigs. Now imagine just how, how much power was in one man. The power of, of many men. But Jesus restrained it and told those spirits what to do with a word. And when we have Jesus Christ in us, you've received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You've yielded and you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't need to be afraid. And you tell those demons that person may start running and there's times of encounter this. And you call them back in the spirit. They begin to run. And you say in Jesus' name, come back. And don't even follow them. But you speak the word. And their demons, even grudgingly, know that they have to obey. And they come back, and they invariably do, because there is power in the name of Jesus. When you speak it in faith and out of relationship with him, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is that true deliverance. When Jesus delivers someone, there is clear and undeniable transformation. Consistently, there is a definite, discernible transformation that you can pick up. And the Bible says that when this man was set free, when the people came to see what had happened, there were three things uh, that the Bible actually points out. It says, number one, he was sitting there, he was dressed, and he was in his right mind. Three things that he couldn't have done before he was delivered. The first thing, he was sitting there. It implies that he was now stable. His erratic, unpredictable behavior was now gone. People were originally afraid to interact with him. They didn't know how he'd react. Was he going to try and choke them? Was he going to chase them? Was he going to say boo and, and do things that were going to make them uncomfortable? Was he going to wreck property? But that was all gone. When someone is possessed, it's difficult to have a consistent pattern of behavior. It's difficult for a person to be reliable, to be decent, to have direction and purpose and progress in life. But that changed when instantly when this man was delivered the next thing it says he was dressed now 
Of course, I believe this is talking about a restoration of dignity. When demons are in a person, they want to cause reproach. They want to humiliate you in front of other people, whether it's to humiliate you in terms of causing you to be incompetent in what you do, or to humiliate you in terms of causing you to have uh, nasty, uh, bad behavior, a reputation for being a fornicator, a reputation for being an abuser, whatever it is. Demons seek to humiliate you and dress you in a sense physically and um, in terms of how people see you socially. But this changed. Dignity was restored to this man. He could find his... Now you could start to function in society. People could interact with him freely without feeling embarrassed. He could find his place in society. If he was going to be a father, he could now be a father. If he was meant to be a husband, he now he could be a husband. You could function again. His function was restored. And when someone is delivered, you can be restored to your position, your place of dignity. If you're meant to be a father, you're meant to be a wife, you're meant to be, behave as a child, you can find your place again in society that you've been robbed of by these demons. The third thing it says he was in his right mind. And this is quite significant. God wants us to have a right mind. And I believe this is the restoration of sound spiritual thinking and spiritual functioning. It's so important to the Lord. That's why even Paul says in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that God has given us a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. It's one of the manifestations of godliness. A sound mind. A right thinking about who God is. A right thinking about your, what your identity is and how you walk. There is spiritual growth. There is a soberness that actually comes. And I found that you actually are able to grow spiritually. When demons are attacking you, even if you have given your life to the Lord, there is a spiritual stagnation. You don't grow. You stay immature. But when demons are removed, you can grow in your understanding of God's word. You can grow in the understanding of who you are and who Jesus Christ is and how you relate to him. There is a growth. There is an understanding. You are also able to share God's word with other people. That childish fear and uh, self-absorption ends and wounds away because there's a sound mind there. That's why even Paul says, um, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, that uh, everything is permissible to me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So the moment that you are delivered from any demon that was oppressing you, you can no longer be mastered by the desire for drugs. You can't be mastered by the desire for sex. You can't be mastered by anger and the desire to destroy whether others or yourself. You can't be mastered by the obsession with death and the desire to kill yourself. Paul says, I will not be mastered by anything. And that's the point that you get to when demons are no longer oppressing you. Because that's God's desire for us to be able to say no. That's why the Bible says the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And you can't say no if you're being oppressed and influenced by demons. Uh, to those influences. But once they, are, they leave, you can actually start to function the way you ought to function and the way you desire to function in a way that pleases God. And the next thing that you realize here is that there is an unreserved willingness to obey Jesus. You know, when demons are cast out of a person or a person's life, it's easier and it's actually preferable to obey the Lord. Now, this man obeyed the Lord. He wanted to cling to Jesus after he'd been delivered. The people right there saw what happened. They were, thought it was weird. They were afraid. They couldn't understand. So instead of embracing him immediately, they actually rejected him and rejected the Lord who had delivered him. And imagine what he must have felt. Instead of people celebrating immediately with him, they're rejecting the one who's delivered him from this torment that had destroyed his life. And they're rejecting him. And so he wanted to go with Jesus, naturally. But Jesus told him, look, you stay and testify. Now, that must have been a daunting thing, because he's saying, look, firstly, you're the one who understands how I got free. You're the one who cared enough to set me free. These people, I don't know what they'll do to me. I can't trust them. They're not celebrating. Maybe some of them were involved in causing this, but Jesus told him, no, in spite of what you feel, stay behind. And what happened? The man stayed behind. It means he was no longer a carnal person. He was able to obey the Lord in spite, of the, in spite of his own feelings and inclinations to go with the Lord, he obeyed. And that's one of the things that happens. It's easier to obey the Lord when demons are not influencing your life. 
There was a newfound self-control and an ability to crucify the flesh. So he was not mastered by his desire to go with the Lord. He obeyed. And the last point is, there must also be a clear transition from tribulation to testimony. The Bible says that this man went around the Decapolis, which means the ten cities, and he testified in obedience to what Jesus had told him. He went around testifying and telling people what the Lord had done for him. And if you read on in Mark, you'll find there's a time that Jesus returned there and there was massive revival because of this man's testimony. He went around ministering from one day being a demon-possessed man called Legion who terrorized the community. He was the next day a minister of the gospel, advancing God's kingdom, speaking life into situations, pointing people to Jesus, dressed in his right mind, speaking the truth to people, drawing people to the light. A wonderful transformation done by Jesus. So deliverance is not complete if you're not able to get to a point where you can testify. And you can only truly know that one is delivered when they are willing and able to testify to what God has done for them and they're able to share that with other people. So saints, I pray that this has been meaningful. This has just been a very brief concursion of, of the many principles that relate to deliverance, but I pray that this has inspired you and will also help you to have some understanding of how a person can be helped by, uh, by the power of the Lord that is resident in us, all who believe in Jesus and are filled by his Holy Spirit. So saints, go out in Jesus' name and bring people to the truth and where demons are encountered, cast them out in Jesus' name and they will leave. So be blessed in Jesus' mighty name.